Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Today on the show, Naomi Murakawa indicts liberals for expanding the system of mass incarceration. And we take a look back at our coverage of the Black Lives Matter movement from its earliest days. All that and a few words from me on mandatory minimum sentences in 1790. Welcome to our program. <music> We keep hearing there's mistrust between police officers and communities of color as if the relationship just needs a little repairing. But the fact is, police don't suffer from a deficit of procedure. They suffer from an excess of power, says our next guest. And liberal procedural reforms are not going to change that. In fact, liberals, as much if not more than conservatives, have expanded our criminal code so as to produce today's mass incarceration or prison state. What do we need to do? Not tweak transform, says Naomi Murakawa, and we would do well to throw out our language about police brutality and profiling. The problem is way bigger. Naomi Murakawa is an associate professor of African American Studies at Princeton and the author of The First Civil Right, How Liberals Built Prison America. Naomi, I'm thrilled to have you here in the studio. Thanks so much for coming in. Let's start with the basics. Mm -hmm. The first civil right refers to a Nixon term, but your story really begins before that, take your pick. You want to start with Nixon or, or where your story starts? Um, let's start with how liberals built prison America. <laughs> okay. So um, there is a really strong conventional wisdom about who built prison America. And that story is about Republicans and their racial tactics. So think Nixon's silent majority, Reagan's war on crack cocaine, Bush the elders, Willie Horton campaign. The story there is conservative law and order was for more, more, more punishment. But the criminal justice system that we have isn't just about more punishment. It's also about more procedural rights, more guidelines to fix sentencing disparity, more and better trained criminal justice professionals, more alternatives to incarceration. These are the trademarks of liberal law and order. And with these, liberals tried to build the bias out of the criminal justice system, but what they did was build a bigger, stronger criminal justice system with procedural rights giving a patina of legitimacy. Mm. So even as we tried to do kind of kindler, gentler policing, we just ended up with more policing. Yeah. But you talk about where this began in terms of our history, the 40s, the mm -hmm. 50s, mm -hmm. Some of the people calling for these changes were people very concerned about civil rights. Yeah, and there is real concern about civil rights, and there is real need to reform the criminal justice system um, in the name of racial fairness. But liberals adopted a particular ideology to explain and justify their transformation, and that ideology is racial liberalism, which is a perspective that says the problem of race is an individual psychological problem of bias and prejudice. It's a mm. cognitive, emotional misfire, um, a rush of hatred or anger or, or fear that comes from some antiquated stereotype, right? And if that's your conception of racism, then that tells you to transform systems in certain ways. It tells you that bias in the criminal justice system actually seeps in through administrators who have an excess of discretionary power. So the battery of reforms are going to be, let's train people, let's try to get rid of their uh, implicit bias, um, let's constrain the way that judges can deploy the prejudice in their sentencing. So we have layer, 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 more procedure, more rules, all the while making the criminal justice system bigger. Simultaneously, racial liberalism keeps telling us to look in all the wrong places. Mm, so. It says, when we're looking for evidence of racism, we need to find it in the mind of the person accused of being a racist. As opposed to? As opposed to observing racial death the way it happens in reality. Mm. So I find it particularly absurd that at this moment, with the world's largest prison system on the planet and the history of the planet, that gets its size from incarcerating African Americans and Latinos, the question on the table seems to be, how do we get evidence of racism? Okay. And the answer is, apparently we need body cams 
as if we need more evidence of racism, right? We don't need this sort of fine-grained detail of what's happening mm -hmm. in each individual administrator's head. We need to embrace the perspective that the black bodies killed, that the black and brown bodies put in cages. That's proof of racism. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to correct. I want to get back to that question of the growth. Is the growth of the prison system and our carceral state, mm -hmm. the state that incarcerates people, an inevitable outgrowth of the way these liberal reforms happened? Or could it have happened a different way? So when the focus is on professionalizing police, modernizing police, and right now and through the 40s, 50s, and 60s, hiring more police, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we ask police to do and right. what are their tools? Right. So maybe they can be trained to be more friendly, um, more sensitive to the community, more culturally competent, more polite. But we still have to ask, what's their job? Right. And their job is enforce, the criminal, enforce criminal law, use force as necessary. And by the way, we're a culture that only knows how to criminalize. We have a variety of social problems, massive inequality and misery, mental illness, drug addiction, homelessness, deep poverty. And we address those with policing. So how is racial liberalism or liberal racism mm -hmm. different from the conservative sort? It has a different tone and tenor, but it's not really different. So we can think about, for example, racial profiling, right? Or what it is to have a profile of black criminality. And when we think about these terms, racial profiling, racial criminalization, the conflation of blackness criminality, there's a tendency to go to the sort of Willie Horton example of there are moments when um, racist politicians exploit public sentiment and put forward these stereotypes, right? And that's certainly true. But we also have a standard refrain that we hear from a variety of left-leaning actors, and that refrain is, black people commit crime because they've been injured, because they're poor, because they face discrimination. Now, these may sound like opposites. It may sound like you have conservatives saying, let's be contemptuous about black people's bad choices, mm -hmm. and you have liberals saying, let's have pity for black people's bad social conditions. Sounds a little different in tone, but the target is the same. The target is black people, right? They've already converged on the most important question, which is, who are we supposed to think of when we think of criminals? They mm. give the same answer. Think about black people. And once the target is locked on black people, that's it. Mm. So let's talk about some of the people that are out there right now um, running for office, say, on the Democratic side. Hillary Clinton was confronted by folks from the Black Lives Matter movement not so long ago about mm -hmm. her record and her record of her, the record of her husband while he was in office. What really concerns me about political elites with whatever alleged good intentions right now is that they are taking what is the truly transformative potential of Black Lives Matter and producing positions of advocacy that are about minor technocratic reforms mm -hmm. that are in many ways likely to make policing stronger. Hillary Clinton is now amongst a chorus of people who are advocating decarceration or alternatives to incarceration. But here again is where um, the history of what liberals have done can really warn us against adding these appendages to the criminal justice system. So what we know is that everything that's introduced as an alternative to incarceration usually becomes a supplement to incarceration. Mm -hmm. Parole was supposed to help cut sentences shorter. Parole officers were supposed to be helpful, almost like social workers. What is it we know now? We know that people being reincarcerated are entering through the parole system where they miss a meeting with a parole officer or they get a job in the county they're not supposed to be in 
and then they're reincarcerated. We have to be very wary about extending the arms of the criminal justice system. And that's a great example because presumably sentencing is done nowadays with the idea that there will be parole. Mm -hmm. And then when there isn't, what are you left with? Just the longer sentence. Yeah. Your book is the extraordinary. The last, I, I don't know, 100 pages seem to be lists of capital crimes, crimes for which you can have the death penalty, mandatory minimum sentences. Mm -hmm. And you make the point that this is all a very speedy speed up, very speedy expansion for mm -hmm. the first 200 years of our history, it wasn't this way. Yeah, that's right. So in 1787, there were three federal crimes. Now there are more than 5,000. There are hundreds and hundreds more at state and local levels, yeah. right? Criminalization, and in particular racial criminalization, is our mode of governance, mm. right? And this is what we have to tackle frontally rather than looking at these sort of administrative tinkerings with the criminal justice system. So I want you to talk to me about how we unravel this. The mm -hmm. only little moment of cheer I get from your analysis is, well, if it escalated so fast, maybe it could de-escalate in our lifetime. Yes. Do you think it's possible? And if so, how? I think that we need to focus on dismantling, attending to the questions of the scale, scope, and racial concentration of the criminal justice system. That means actually turning away from most of the reforms on the table right now, which are about adding some administrative layers to how we're going to check police, adding more training for police. What we need is actually massive decriminalization. So we need to slash incarceration rates without creating prison-like alternatives like house arrest, probation, ankle monitors. We also have to slash the arrest rate without coming up with arrest-like alternatives like summonses and fees and fines. Right? We need to turn away from the criminal justice system entirely and work towards decriminalization. When we think about racial death and the way we use the criminal justice system to hold the class and color line, we should not, in our reform, think about the worst or the most extreme cases. Mm -hmm. So the reforms for policing now actually shouldn't be organized around these incidents of policing that allegedly has gone wrong. Mm -hmm. We actually need to look at the cases where policing goes right, <laughs> right? So let's just look at the modal case, the typical case. The bread and butter of what police do is that they arrest and give summonses for misdemeanor offenses. Right. The typical case in a criminal court is a misdemeanor case. So when, and here we're talking about things like um, being caught driving with a suspended license, um, perhaps public drunkenness, vandalism, um, if you're young, if you're um, black and young, or black transgender and gender nonconforming, pickups for curfew violation, um, r for running away, for right? This is what we're looking at when we talk mm -hmm. about the problems of criminals that we're dealing with. We actually need to just turn away from that entire apparatus, mm -hmm. stop trying to perfect it, and begin the task of massive decriminalization. Are there models out there that you're excited about where people are doing the kind of rollback, unpicking the carceral state in ways that you think could be replicable? So I think that it is certainly a step in the right direction uh, when organizers from Black Lives Matter call for an end to broken windows policing. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I hear that is, let's change the routine, everyday, bread and butter way that policing happens. Let's not just look at the so-called extreme cases. That's tremendously important work. We need to, in undoing broken windows policing, undo it not just as policing tactic or strategy or attitude, but we actually need to decriminalize all the parts of the criminal code that empower police to make those decisions. There's lots more in the book, people. The First Civil Right, How Liberals Built Prison America by our guest, Naomi Murakawa. Thank you so much for coming in. We will put a link to the book at our website. There's more coming up. Stay tuned. 
This program has been on the streets and in the studio with activists from the Black Lives Matter movement from the very first days. Today we present a look back at some of the highlights of our coverage. Black Lives Matter really started as a love note to our people. It was really important that we establish a really broad notion of who is Black America mm -hmm. these days. We have to see this as a global movement. We can't see our issues as just domestic issues. In the aftermath of the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the murder of Trayvon Martin, I know I personally felt like I got punched in the gut. Living black in America, we do know that it's rare that justice is served for black communities. The other thing we were hearing was, this is a terrible tragedy, and so what we need to do is X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z being pull up your pants. X, Y, and Z being we need to vote, we need better education, we need stronger families. But all of those things really blame black communities for our own conditions. I think the mere fact we, there are folks who have to say that, like I matter, that means there's inherently something that's telling you that I'm not. Let us live, let us explore, let us, you know, be able to live within our bodies and be comfortable. The issue was never just about Mike Brown. It was about a, an endemic system, an endemic sort of history of police violence. There can't be economic justice in this country unless there's racial justice in this country. The refusal of folks in the U.S. to see what it is that we are doing around race um, recreates these structures of segregation. When uh, cops kill young people, anyone, um, and we blame just the cop, we're making a big mistake because it is the system that created the violence. We in this country have all been infected by our history of racial inequality. I think we're all compromised by this narrative of racial difference now, that was created during the time of slavery. And if we're going to free ourselves, if we're going to cure this infection, we're going to have to talk about these errors in our history that we have not yet addressed. The constitutional amendments after the, during and after the Civil War were supposed to free uh, African-American slaves. It did something for about 10 years. Then there was a North-South Compact, which essentially granted the, the former slave-owning states the right to do whatever they wanted. And what they did was criminalize black life. The capacity to kill is actually a precondition for the capacity to incarcerate. And so we have to address both of those problems. And in order to do that, we have to think about the entire social order. What kind of economy do we want to live in? And how can we organize it in the richest country in the history of the world? The function of law enforcement in the United States is to police uh, the lines or perimeters, as you would say, around sex and gender and around sex and sexuality as much as they are around race. So one of the things that we've been trying to talk about is how the exclusion of women and girls actually undermines the ability to see the structural dimension of the problem. We have a community of folks that are oppressed in many ways in, in black and brown communities by different state systems in different ways. We can't think that we can um, empower them in these communities by saying we're just going to empower the men in the communities because we're just sort of extending, reflecting, mirroring the sort of patriarchal framework that says that um, men are front and women are second. And that just, that's not what we need. That's not where we're at. <laughs> We saw folks from South Africa, folks from Ireland, folks from all over the world sending messages. 
What's important to us in Black Lives Matter is that we are elevating and cultivating the leadership of folks who have not been included in the conversation. That includes Black trans women, that includes Black immigrant women, Black disabled folks, Black incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. The way that we understand how movements happen in this country is behind one charismatic leader. And it's really hard for people to wrap their heads around a movement that is full of leaders. You got to go in just like a jazz musician trying to learn something from the younger generation. You know you have a certain genuine humility and a certain willingness to learn and listen. If we want a full democracy in this country, we can't just have people following one person. Everyone has to feel like they have a stake in shaping the kind of world that we live in. Radical revolutionary movements or movements of revolt are unseen by the mainstream society uh, until they erupt. We need to hear the voices of young people because the Black Freedom Movement is not going to remain alive if it's not transmitted and bequeathed through the younger generation. When we talk about black liberation being intrinsic to everybody's liberation, we're really talking about how systems in this country have been not only built off of the backs of black people and, and exploited labor, but certainly have been crafted to exclude black people. And so if we're able to dismantle those systems, everybody has a chance, a better chance of living a better life. We want to create a different kind of movement culture. We think it's important, we think we need it, and we don't think that we can survive without it. Move if you got the nerve, lash out for your just desserts. It's not just the words. Some of y'all heads up in the cloud. I'ma bring y'all back to earth. It's black back to burn. I'm talking about out your mouth, I'm not concerned. Cause y'all got the nerve. It's y'all turn like Detroit. For more of our special coverage on Black Lives Matter, check out our website. What got a person locked up, no matter what, in 1790? Piracy, period. At the birth of the Republic, mandatory minimum sentences were a rare and targeted thing. Attacking and robbing ships at sea got your life. No ifs, ands, or buts. What gets a person a mandatory minimum sentence today? Any one of 261 different crimes. Princeton professor Naomi Murakawa took a look for her book, The First Civil Right, How Liberals Built Prison America. In that, she chronicles how for the first 200 years, Americans managed somehow to get by with only a handful of mandatory minimum laws. Those governed specific federal crimes. Refusing to testify before Congress would get you a month, bribing a federal inspector six months, forging a U.S. seal a year. It wasn't until the 1980s that Congress started passing mandatory minimums left and right, and we do mean left and right. Two terms of tough on crime, Reagan and Bush Republicans added 72 new and expanded mandatory minimum statutes. Clinton's two terms added 116. A third offense of carrying a firearm now brought a mandatory 15-year term. Possession of five grams of crack cocaine a five-year mandatory minimum. Quoting Joe Biden in 1994, Murakawa reminds us of the liberal Democrats' approach to all this. Quote, the liberal wing of the Democratic Party is now for 60 new death penalties, 100,000 cops. The liberal wing of the Democratic Party is for 124,000 new state prison cells. This, let's remember, is the period that saw black versus white racial ratios among the imprisoned go from three to one to eight to one. Tripled between 1985 and 2000, the number of mandatory minimum crimes engorged the prison system and locked up, especially women, mostly women with children. In Murakawa's book, the list of mandatory minimum statutes on the books in 2010 runs to 20 tightly typed pages. The perils of post-war liberal law and order are worth recalling now, says Murakawa, when demands for reform are loud but modest in scope. It's not rocket science why the U.S. has the world's biggest prison population by far. It's our policy of imprisoning. The solution's not kinder, gentler incarceration or better oversight. It's an entirely different approach. Mm -hmm.